To get started, Chris has been the president of the Ontario Mining Association since 2004 and has helped facilitate member companies' rapid responses and information sharing to ensure the well being of workers and greater public safety. He also witnessed efforts by companies to support relief efforts to aid communities and help fight COVID 19. He will describe how OMA members have adjusted and collaborated to protect workers while rallying to support our neighbours and community organizations in need. So Chris, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine, and uh, thank you uh, for the organizing committee for reaching out to uh, our chair, Peter Xavier, and inviting the Ontario Mining Association to take part in the uh, general uh, meeting. I'm very pleased to be representing our association tonight. It's, uh, it's great to recognize some familiar initials uh, and names <laughs> in the virtual uh, conference room. Um, you've all worked really tirelessly over the last months uh, to keep uh, mining going and to keep the CIM going as well, uh, while keeping the community safe and the families afloat in these, uh, these times. So thank you and uh, for your efforts, uh, for being here and um, for to share and maybe to learn some lessons. It's an opportunity for us. Uh, so hopefully everything goes well tonight. Um, the CIM Sudbury branch has devoted this meeting to a topic that's most important of all, keeping people safe, uh, healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me open up by talking in general terms about, as Christine mentioned, the OMA efforts in that regard. I will then give the floor to uh, Bethany Brody, Director of Sustainability of the OMA member company, New Gold. And Beth will describe New Gold's experience with implementing rapid uh, COVID-19 testing as part of the screening protocols at the Rainy River Mine site. Um, she will be supported by Gabrielle Falk, who is part of the Rainy River HR team, who has been documenting and organizing all their testing efforts. So for Ontario miners, uh, as you know, safety is our first priority and always. Um, your efforts and those of your colleagues and partners mean that Ontario is one of the safest mining jurisdictions in the world. Uh, mining is one of, um, we've achieved a 96% uh, improvement in lost time injury frequency over the past 30 years while building a world class health and safety culture. So uh, thank you for being a part of that. Uh, this has uh, proved to be an invaluable asset uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, if it was not uh, clear to everyone earlier, it's uh, obvious now that uh, in a time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, mining is indispensable for a response to and recovery from this crisis. As an industry providing the materials that are the front end of our healthcare manufacturing supply chains, mining was deemed essential by the province throughout this uh, crisis. This presented us with a challenge. Uh, we needed to balance our economic responsibilities with the imperative to keep our people and communities safe. It's a testament to the strength of our safety culture and our people's expertise that uh, we managed to keep our workforces mostly virus free uh, while continue to operate. From the onset of this uh, public health crisis, mining companies were able to react very quickly. Uh, we adapted uh, existing protocols and tapped into knowledge from other jurisdictions. For example, uh, companies like Barrick were able to look to their African operations uh, for lessons learned from dealing with the Ebola outbreak. Uh, while the diseases are not the same, many lessons in prevention were transferable to COVID-19. Much of what the miners did was ahead of the curve, going beyond the government guidelines. Uh, examples uh, like distancing measures, um, Limits on gatherings of groups, uh, staggering shifts, increased cleaning, physical barriers, limits on the number of people entering a cage, and early adoption of masks. You know, while the debate was still raging about their utility, mining, we'd already done that. Our members also came up with uh, creative ways to support employee mental health, including online uh, wellness programs and family events. So as an association, the OMA saw our role as a, a sort of a hub of information sharing. We mobilized uh, research capabilities and established an online portal uh, for members. Uh, we shared um, the latest information and resources. Uh, we also had uh, weekly uh, mind manager calls and Brian Wilson's on the call tonight, I see, and uh, he led that. It's, it included a discussion board and allowed our members to share questions and concerns with each other. We also facilitated a number of regular meetings so our members could connect with each other, but also with uh, government officials and others that uh, were relevant. Early on, uh, when there was a severe shortage of uh, personal protective equipment, we worked with the Ministry of Northern Development Mines and as well the Ministry of Health to coordinate BPP don donations by member companies, and uh, many of them gave very generously. Um, you probably saw it in the paper, it spurred us to start keeping track of the many impressive stories the mining companies uh, 
that were stepping up to serve uh, their communities. The swiftness and the breadth of the community support offered by our member companies was a source of tremendous pride. We did our best to share as many of those stories as we could on the social media using uh, the hashtag this is mining and the hashtag in this together. The stories were a real morale booster uh, for us and an illustration of the legacy that mining companies are building our communities and making them better where they operate. As the immediate uh, shock of the crisis passed, it became clear that COVID-19 will probably be part of our new normal for some time to come. Uh, protocols in place at mine sites have been largely successful in limiting the spread of COVID-19, and our established safety culture has helped with a quick and effective implementation for, to prevent uh, uh, it spreading. But it was clear to us that going forward, we needed sort of a broad systematic access to COVID-19 testing. Um, in addition to existing protocols, we needed to reduce the risk to workers, protect our local communities, as well as help stabilize the operations while reopening the economy. In addition to uh, researching testing options on behalf of members, we worked with six member companies on a pilot project proposed to uh, and aimed at implementing proven testing modalities like molecular and antibody on-site at remote mine sites. In doing so, we hope to address a number of public health priorities, uh, the safe reopening of uh, operations of the mining industry, the protection of local remote communities, specifically targeting the most vulnerable and the least access to existing infrastructure, such as First Nations and the elderly. The pilot proposal served as a means to advocate with Health Canada for more devices to be approved that could be used for screening rather than diagnostic purposes. While Health Canada has been uh, very deliberate in its approval process, it eventually did authorize two point of care tests that don't require the use of a lab to generate results and more recently expressed an openness to consider at-home devices that would be used for screening rather than diagnosis. Uh, we think they can go a lot further than this. Uh, we can't think of another country in the world that uh, doesn't have uh, rapid uh, antibody tests that are uh, less, uh, does, you know, they don't require a medical practitioner to, to operate. Among the first uh, companies though to jump on the opportunity that was provided by uh, Health Canada is the uh, approval of the first point of care COVID tests. Uh, was an OMA member, New Gold. Their quest for mine site virus-free zones made headlines and generated a lot of interest from a variety of sectors. And it's uh, our pleasure tonight and my pleasure, uh, especially to hand over the camera to Bethany, who will talk about New Gold's experience, describe the lessons learned, and uh, outline the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you. And I'd be happy after best presentation to uh, uh, join her in any of the questions you may have of uh, her or myself after her presentation. So welcome, Beth, it's uh, all yours. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the CIM Sudbury branch for having us on. Um, as you can imagine, after the story of C with CBC actually aired, we've had a lot of interest in what's been going on at our Rainy River operation uh, in the last little bit. And so I'm just going to pull up our, a quick presentation, but this will be more uh, conversational from me. Uh, and then happy to answer any questions. And I do have Gabby with uh, with me as well, who will be here to be able to help answer any of the activities that have happened at Rainy, as she's here on our HR team and has been a bit of the lead on making sure that our communications with our employees and contractors has gone as smoothly as possible. So un or just like many other companies in the area, uh, when COVID hit, uh, we hit the ground running, figuring out how do we protect our employees, our contractors and the surrounding communities we have a huge obligation to all of those stakeholders to make sure that we're upholding the uh, highest precautions and measures possible when it comes to screening and protection. And so we did what many of you did, putting in uh, screening protocols, all of the mask wearing, social distancing, sanitizing, working with communities to ensure that they had the proper PPE and resources to protect our employees and also keep our operations going. We were back in April introduced to precision biomonitoring that uh, came to us and said that they did have a point of care device that uh, they were hoping to get approved by Health Canada. Um, we started conversations with them and went through their whole process of what this device was, how it worked, and uh, ended up signing an agreement with them upon the approval of, of Health Canada that we would be able to access their device. Um, at the same time, we were talking to Spartan, we were talking to Gardex, we were talking to private clinics, trying to find a way that we could get more reliable and accessible testing to our site uh, in order to build that confidence and have the ability to fully say we are COVID free and we're going to do our best to stay that way. Um, 
we all know what happened with Spartan. Uh, we, we probably all had those conversations with them as well. And so uh, when the approval for PBI did come through, uh, New Gold was fortunate enough to be the first company to receive their devices. Um, fortunate and also getting to be the guinea pig has been a real experience for our Rainy River operations, for our teams here to be implementing and rolling out uh, and to get testing up and running. As you can see from the photo, the, the device is quite small. It's the size of a, a Bluetooth speaker and it runs all off of a cloud-based uh, platform that is run through a cell phone. Uh, and the device can run nine tests uh, at once with a turnaround time once the tests are in the, in the device of about 65 minutes. Uh, you do need to have both a nurse and a lab tech uh, do the swab and then also actually run the test as per Health Canada's guidelines on this. So we have been able uh, on our staffing to bring in two nurses, two lab techs, both that are on cross shift. We have one full time lab tech uh, that was on our team already and one COVID lead that's coming in to uh, oversee all of the testing that's um, taking place at Rainey and that continues to roll out. Um, when we first started with implementing the, uh, the device, uh, there were a few challenges. Where do you put this? How do you do screening? Who gets tested? Who doesn't get tested? All of those questions, which we are still uh, sorting out at this moment and still rolling out in different phases. I will say that upon our training, when we had first uh, put the devices up, we were having our lab techs uh, and nurses trained on, on the swabs and the actual sample uh, extraction and prep. Uh, we did have um, a, sh a string of false positives in a sequence that did come out through some of our trial testing. And it was a very quick learning of being able to dig into uh, the, the case as to why that was that um, the area that we ha had the test uh, screen on, as you can see that little plate with the, with the holes in it where we have where the tests are, the samples are put, we hadn't cleaned that with a high enough bleach solution in between uh, tests. And so we click quickly were able to uh, sort that out. We ran all the tests again and thankfully uh, to, this, to this day we have yet to have a non-negative result come back. So um, we were pretty happy about that, as well as making sure that our lab techs really did have the experience that they needed to prep samples. Um, so having that background, having worked in a lab before, being able to do diagnostics, that sort of thing was really important for ensuring that human error was as minimal as possible uh, with the expertise and experience that they bring in pipetting and working with enzymes and small sampling, that, uh, those types of issues. So we do have two devices that are running here at Rainy River Operation, uh, Rainy River Mine. We are looking at uh, really increasing a lot, a lot of our testing with our camp over the coming weeks with um, swabbing at our camp and bringing those swabs to site for testing to be ran uh, in a sequence. Um, we don't prohibit people as long as they are asymptomatic from entering the site once their swab is taken. They are allowed on site, uh, wearing a mask, following all of the procedures and protocols that we have. Uh, and then their results are given to them by a nurse. Uh, we'll either call them or send them an email to give them the results uh, as soon as they come in. Um, if anyone is positive, uh, they are uh, referred to public health and public health uh, will then do all the contact tracing, we'll retest them for confirmation and uh, they'll take the, the case on from that point. Um, so we have been really prioritizing who are the highest risk individuals coming in. Uh, our testing at our site occurs for three reasons. Uh, we heavily rely on volunteers to be tested if anyone is showing symptoms or if you don't pass our screening um, questionnaire. Our screening questionnaire is very specific about traveling outside of the immediate area over the past 48 hours, which is allowing us to be able to capture a bigger amount of people uh, and rolling that out into more uh, phases of increasing our testing. That's going to allow us to capture a lot of contractors and employees coming onto site. Uh, Gabby has been responsible for all of the communications uh, to our employees and to contractors and continues to do a great job with providing any updates, whether that be on forms, our screening process is changing, uh, testing protocol changing. We do that um, right away to make sure that people have time to digest information, change their travel plans if need be, show up at camp a little bit earlier, whatever it may be. 
Um, so we've been pretty proactive on, on that front. Um, overall, the devices have been uh, quite a benefit to the site just to provide relief that we are able to test employees, we are able to test uh, contractors. With the start of school coming back, we're seeing a, a bigger need for testing and people wanting to be tested to protect their family, their friends, uh, the crews that they're working on. So we are we are seeing quite a positive um, attitude towards testing and being able to have testing come forward. Um, I will say we when we were initially doing our trial testing, we started out with doing nasal swabs. Uh, anyone who has gone through a COVID test through public health uh, and has done a nasal swab will know that those are not comfortable tests to do. Uh, and it was a bit of a, a barrier for people to, to want to volunteer to be tested. We have switched to oral for a couple of reasons, one being that it is uh, more comfortable. Uh, we do still, we are still able to collect enough of a sample uh, of the virus if it was there to, to make the test accurate, as well as sourcing swabs has been the biggest challenge that we've faced so far. And we found that we are able to source oral swabs much quicker than we have been able to source uh, nasal swabs. So we have, that's a bit of an overview of what our, our testing has been. We, will, we have been working with a couple other companies in Ontario who have been also testing. Um, Alamos has been uh, a really good partner in this. Um, and I, they know that I'm gonna be speaking about them tonight, but they at their Island Gold uh, facility, they have done a great job with their rollout of testing as well. And so our teams are able to meet on a biweekly basis to really share learnings, um, talk about any challenges that we're facing, talk about any legal implications uh, or anything like that from a liability standpoint or risk standpoint that either company is, is walking through. And they, we've been able to form a really great partnership to ensure that as more of these tests are rolling out, uh, we can hopefully save a lot of uh, companies the headaches of some of the first challenges that we faced. So we do, um, we, do we are going to continue to ramp up of our testing. Our goal is that we will be testing all employees and contractors uh, on a regular basis, particularly going into this next phase as we're seeing numbers rise across the province again or across the country even. We do want to make sure that we are keeping that the health and safety of our employees and the surrounding communities at the utmost importance and priority of the site. And these devices really are allowing us to do that and to provide that, that confidence that we uh, were able to to share and be able to do those results. So I wanted to um, leave it at that for right now because I know that there are generally a lot of questions that come with the implementation of these devices. Um, and I do know that Gabby is also here for the employee and more site-based activities. Um, she may be able to actually speak a bit about the, the rollout from what the site was doing pre-PBI uh, tests coming onto site. Uh, to then being able to ramp over to actually starting testing. So before we open to questions, I'll pass it over to her to, to address those. Hi, so from a communications perspective, um, responding to the risks that COVID presented to our site was a huge priority and we needed to get it right, right from the very beginning. So a key, uh, task that we did was to establish a pandemic response team. So this is a team um, on site, which was comprised of key members from the various departments. And we held meetings as needed and we needed to be really flexible, really fluid to uh, have quick availability as things came up. You know, COVID was constantly changing. So sometimes we would even find ourselves meeting a couple of times a day to address the new concerns. Um, as we worked to plan our, our response to COVID, uh, communication was really important uh, with the management team and then disseminating it down through to the superintendents, supervisors, and down to the crews, and consistent messaging. To assist with the consistent messaging to ensure that every single employee knew exactly how we were handling the different protocols, the preventative measures, addressing the risks. We would also have site-wide uh, communication memos, so for all employees and our contractors. We also use a program called Coffee Box 
to um, explain our different protocols for screening, testing to, to contractors that we might not have personal contact information for. Um, another key piece, uh, once we established our COVID response protocols, screening protocols, testing protocols, was to have uh, one point of contact in human resources for responding to our employees' questions, especially when you're implementing something um, as new and wonderful as the capability to test on site. It was really important to have consistent responses to everybody. So everybody, everybody is treated fairly, receiving the same information. So we have one point of contact in human resources to respond to questions like, so I've been tested. Now what? How are you treating my absence from work? I have symptoms. I can't come to work. What's going to happen to me? And so uh, there's one person responding to questions about sick days, short-term disability, or general leaves of absence. Also those questions that are becoming more and more frequent now that schools and daycares are back up and running. When their children can't attend school or daycare because they're presenting a symptom of illness, employees are wondering, how do I handle my absence from work because I have to stay home to care for my child. So again, we have one person responding to these questions for consistency. Another key thing is building on consistency, I can't say it enough, is uh, having one point of contact that bridges between human resources and health and safety to respond to our employees and our medical staff who have questions about how are we handling screening and testing protocols on site and at, and at camp. So some key learnings that we've uh, learned from as we've, as we've gone, um, it's been so important for us to ensure that we have the right people at the table in our discussions with representation from all over site. This is to ensure that we have a full picture perspective and understanding the impact of our decisions. What we might think is fine to implement for a protocol might have a drastic impact on staff that are arriving uh, at camp, for example. And it's another learning has been for us to communicate as early as possible and to be as transparent as possible. You know, there's that saying that in the absence of information, people make up information. And so we've learned from that, especially when we did have our series of false positive tests, that it is so important to get ahead of it and communicate as early and as transparently as possible to minimize any panic or to minimize any misinformation. And, and finally, our other key learning here is the importance of documentation, documenting our different protocols for testing scenarios, how to classify employee absences, work from home practices, and, as, and uh, some frequently asked FAQ documents to assist our managers and supervisors so they can respond from the questions they're getting from their employees. Um, and and just, uh, just recently, this afternoon, you know, we, uh, we're always developing, further refining our practices. So for example, um, we are revising our employee medical questionnaire. We are uh, wanting to be more uh, aligned with the questionnaires that uh, are being used at schools, screening for symptoms. So we're constantly learning, constantly evolving. And so again, we wanna communicate as early and often as possible. So we've communicated today, for example, for a change that we're not implementing until ne uh, mid next week, just so that it gives employees an opportunity to um, feel like they've been included, uh, that they're respected, that we wanna give them plenty of notice 
and it just helps with the buy-in and gives them a chance to ask any questions, express any concerns, because um, getting their buy-in so that they want to participate in all of these practices we're implementing to help protect them is so important for us. I will also say that, uh, that when we have employee testing, we have taken the approach that anyone who is being tested on site uh, will be signing a waiver, two waivers. One waiver is to share information with public health. So to make sure that anyone who's tested knows that their information could be shared with public health. Again, that goes to contact tracing, working with public health, ensuring that we're not working outside of the system, but continuing to work with the uh, with the government on that front as we all continue to manage COVID. And the other is a, a liability um, waiver as well. So we all know why that's in place to help buy down risk. Uh, so we have a waiver that's being signed uh, for anyone who is who is uh, testing that way. Um, and I am I do see the chat just in the in the side, and I do see that Nadim uh, did you know ask a question as how we became an early adopter and. Quite honestly, I don't, I don't know if we are an early adopter or we were just the first ones to get the device. I think everyone wanted rapid testing. Everyone saw the need for it. Everyone was talking to Spartan. Everyone was going uh, to the, the contacts and the places that they could to get it. And uh, we really did jump on with precision biomonitoring quite quickly and establish that relationship with them very early on in, in the spring. Um, but even with PBI, we got to a point where we were having the discussions internally of will this ever get approved? Uh, it was sitting with Health Canada for so long uh, that we started looking at every other option again um, and, and thought this isn't gonna get approved. The Health Canada isn't gonna push this through. So we need to rapidly think about a, a next plan. And thankfully it did uh, right at the time where we kind of shared internally that I don't think this is gonna happen. That night I got the call saying they're approved, your devices are on their way. So it all happened very, very quickly. Um, and I know uh, just based on, on talking with PBI that since, uh, since they have been approved, they've been sending devices all across the country, all across the province, um, getting them to, to different, uh, different mines, different operations, but other private companies as well. So we were just um, a bit fortunate to have jumped on with them when we did, and that, that just jumped us to the front of the line for being able to implement them. So at that point, I think uh, we can pass it over to either either Chris or Christy to, or just open it up to, to um, any sort of questions. And again, we're here to, to talk about any of our experiences we are a pretty open book about it. We want you guys to be able to learn from what we've done and not uh, not have the same pitfalls that we've had, uh, and happy to to answer to answer anything that any questions anyone may have. Great, thank you very much, Chris and Beth and Gabrielle. I'm going to uh, read out Nadim's very first question, and it's geared uh, towards you, Chris. So great to see you both, Beth, um, today, Chris, both you and Beth today, Chris, apologies. Just wondering what online platform software OMA decided to use to facilitate the collaborative dialogue among your members, including the discussion board you noted in your presentation. Yeah, uh, thanks, Nadim. It's good, good to hear from you as well. The uh, SharePoint is what we use at the OMA, and uh, most of our members have access to that. Uh, if they don't, we set them up with an account. Thank you. And another question, pilot projects are a great idea. How open were the health authorities to these types of initiatives? Well, we, we had a joint meeting with Minister uh, Rickford and uh, Seamus uh, Regan uh, that facilitated this to meet with Health uh, Canada. And we, were, we got pretty high up in their food chain. Um, they were very polite, they listened well, but there wasn't a real, uh, uh, as Beth mentioned, uh, there wasn't an urgency to approve more testing than the diagnostic testing. They couldn't get their heads around the difference between uh, screening and diagnostic. Uh, we were doing temperature for screening, we're doing questionnaires, but uh, a lot of these asymptomatic uh, uh, patients were being missed and we were quite worried about our employees and our communities. So we wanted to have what uh, pretty well every other country, I think Singapore has been doing a saliva test since February, uh, just at their airports. Um, there's rapid turnaround time, 10 to 15 minutes, and you can do uh, you know vast numbers of them. They're, they're about 95% out here, but it's better than the screening that we have presently. 
Um, so they're not interested in that. Uh, what they have approved that Beth got uh, uh, described in, in uh, Gabriel in great detail uh, is sort of a, a compromise. And I'm glad to hear that they don't have to do the nasal swab anymore. Uh, they can do the saliva. So that's uh, or the oral. Um, that's an improvement. But it's still it's still expensive and it's still time consuming, right? You can't uh, you can't do uh, two thousand people in you know an hour or two. Uh, it's it's a process where you got to rotate them through. But it's better than the labs that we set up. You know, in the early days, some of our companies had to actually pay for and install and staff uh, full blown medical labs. Um, and so you know the new gold situation is a much greater improvement than that. Uh, we'd like to see them push out a little further. They won't answer the question. I, I can't find another country in the world that hasn't approved uh, these other type of tests. In fact, I think in the United States they have 180 that are approved. Uh, we had uh, in the early going, we we almost paid for uh, uh, Dr. Eric Hoskins to help us uh, negotiate with Health Canada. So on a personal level, they were great to deal with. Uh, just the results uh, haven't come forward yet. I think there's still it's a live issue. I think they'll eventually uh, do what other countries have done and uh, people will have access to a better screening uh, uh, test than they have now. Thank you. Um, so do you have any information on the reliability of this um, or other point of care tests as opposed to the conventional COVID test being done? Yeah, so it goes down to there's a difference between diagnostic and screening. So in screening, you're going to get, you know, probably about 95 percent. Right now, it's a huge improvement over a temperature check or a questionnaire. And in terms of diagnostics, Beth could probably tell you um, more in line with, uh, you're, you're fairly consistent with the lab tests, aren't you, uh, Beth? We are. And the devices so far with the with what is coming out of PBI and Biomeme is that they do have a 99% accuracy for their, uh, for their results. Really, um, if there is error, error most likely is occurring because of human error. So again, that goes back to making sure that you really have uh, someone who knows how to do uh, extractions, enzyme extractions, prep your samples, all of that, um, that, they, that they know what they're doing because that's where you're going to run across error. You, you will get every once in a while an in inconclusive test, uh, which can be ran again. Again, generally is a human error that's, uh, that's caused that. Uh, we've seen that typically when we've been training a new uh, lab tech on the device and uh, getting them used to it. That's when our uh, invalids have come up. Um, but we haven't had uh, many of any of those in actual tests when the after the lab tests have or the lab techs have been trained. But the accuracy is quite high and uh, public health, the public health unit in this area knows that we're using these devices. Uh, they've been on site. Uh, they've seen these devices um, and you know, we've, we've received comments of, why don't we have these? What, how are you able to get results back in an hour and a half and we still have to send ours to Toronto? Um, so there is even that, that dialogue happening with the, with the health units in this area as well. Thank you. Nadim just typed that she feels bad for the public health authorities. <laughs> You really do, quite honestly, when I mean, hopefully this this helps alleviate some of those pain points with being able to test employees or being able just to see where hotspots are happening. But you really do uh, feel bad for public health and for some of those health units who don't have access to this and for people who don't have access to even get to public health. Like it's it is it is quite shocking to see. And my opinion, just my opinion, uh, it is shocking to see uh, how the government has actually handled this uh, with not uh, approving more devices, with not being more on top of uh, screening protocols and being able to to support industries that are that are able to support them by by purchasing and, and rolling these testing devices out. Excellent, thank you. So Gabrielle, not a question, but more of a comment from Nadine. Thank you for ta talking through the incredible, thoughtful approach to communications with the, the company took. Seems to have been a really key to success, particularly the consistency angle, as you noted, and it takes a lot of careful thinking and effort. So we do have a question now from Dan Lang. Um, how does Newgold address more uh, transient visitors to sites such as delivery truck drivers? And what would the process of a driver disable um, displayed symptoms? I'll take on that question for us. So with more transient visitors to sites, such as a delivery truck driver, or perhaps someone that's uh, 
doing a, a food delivery. Um, all visitors to site are required to make a stop at our security office at our main gate. And we have signage up that directs them to do this. And uh, before entering the security office, um, masks are required. So once again, signage up on the door. And we've limited the number of uh, individuals that are allowed in the main security office. Once inside, they're directed to um, sanitize their hands and they're provided an iPad to complete their pre-screening questionnaire. And um, it gets reviewed by um, one of our security staff or one of our medical staff. And if they have a question that gets flagged, then the nurse does look at it and would work through with them making the recommendations about whether they are allowed to proceed to enter on site or not. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? Any comments, discussion? This is our this is your opportunity. Oh, here we go. Um, Nadine, so one of the challenges many mining companies talked about in the first few months was the pressure that some Indigenous employees faced from their fellow community members to not go into work. Wondering how this point of uh, care system was received by the in your Indigenous partners. This is a, a great question. And uh, this was one of the reasons why we jumped on um, getting one of these devices or multiple of these devices to Rainy River. Uh, just because where we are situated, we are partnered with 16 Indigenous communities uh, that surround our operation. Uh, when we were waiting for Health Canada's approval, we immediately started working with our local area uh, leadership uh, to be writing letters to ministers, to be lobbying on our behalf. We worked with the Grand, uh, Grand Council of Treaty 3 and uh, Grand Chief Francis Cavano to be leaning on his contacts and leaning on Indigenous Affairs, leaning on Health Canada, leaning on public health, anyone that we could get to. Rickford heard from us probably more times than he wanted to during this whole thing, trying to get this de these devices approved. But we really, really did rely and work very closely with our Indigenous partners to uh, get these devices approved. So we do, uh, we do have a third device that is on site. We have uh, set that device aside for community testing because of the Health Canada regulations around who can use the device, how it can be used. We're still in the process and working with the local area chiefs to determine who is best suited to have that device, whether it be a health unit um, or through public health or through a hospital. We're looking at a whole bunch of different scenarios, but we really did want to honor the fact that they pushed just as hard as we did to get the PBI device approved. Uh, and so we wanna be able to provide that testing. So at this point, indigenous employees who are coming on site to uh, either volunteer or uh, don't go or don't are coming in for camp, whatever it may be, they'll be tested, which does have an impact on their communities. Um, chiefs, uh, chief and councils were very happy when we got the device, we shared the news right away. Uh, we continue to work with them to encourage their employees to come and be tested because if their employee is tested and they can bring that negative result home, obviously that helps with protection of the of communities. But it uh, it was a huge support that they provided to us during that time of, of getting the approval. Uh, and we continue to work with them now that we have the devices on site. Great. Thank you, Beth. Does anybody have any uh, any final questions? Oh, there we go, Trang. Um, since part, uh, participation is particularly based on volunteers, she's curious to know what the initial uptake was like. Was there any resistance or were empl employees more than willing to participate? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we we haven't had severe resistance to be to be tested and to go and be swabbed. I will say when it was the nasal swabs, people did not want to go and do that. Uh, right. There were you know some horror stories of people who had been tested through public health and the pain and all of that, and and so there was quite a resistance to well, I'm not going to go do that. 
Um, but we have found that once the oral swabs have come through and, and people are talking about how when they go and get swabbed, it's an oral swab and not a nasal swab, that actually has uh, been a, a, huge, a huge benefit for us, for people wanting to get tested. Um, we haven't had a, a straight out no to be tested yet. We are ramping up, continuing to ramp up testing. So next week will actually be our highest uh, amount of testing that we've done on site yet. We have, uh, as Gabby said this morning, the stars are all aligning and every one of our rotations changes next week, uh, both for our employees and our contractors. So it happens once every three to four weeks. Um, and this is a week that we can actually capture that mass amount of uh, testing. And so that will really be a learning point for us to see if there is any of that resistance um, and then how we manage that moving forward uh, if there is any big resistance that comes that at that time. Excellent, thank you. And a question just in from Scott. Uh, thank you, everyone. Given your experience, what role do you think a municipality, in our case Sudbury, could play in ex expediting rapid testing for the benefit of our own mining companies and suppliers? And they're exploring that. I think uh, I think that's going to be the next stage. You're going to see uh, premiers coming out wanting more tests, more options like they have in other countries, uh, so that the employers uh, can test their own employees or even people coming on their site. Um, and it might be uh, you know there's 181 of these tests approved uh, just south of the border. Uh, like I said, Asia was ahead of that, uh, uh, even at their airports. Uh, and so it's short wait time, cheaper costs but a 95% accuracy. If you trigger either the, uh, the quick uh, test that's uh, less intrusive uh, or the questionnaire or the temperature, then you go into the healthcare system for the diagnostics and you're quarantined while you wait for those results. Mm -hmm. That's the way it works in most countries. And so they're, they're testing like millions of people every day, right? We're testing a few um, that go through for the nasal swab. And then uh, mining sort of leading the way uh, with New World and others. Uh, I think you're gonna see that really pick up. So I think you're gonna see provinces uh, asking for it and municipalities. Sounds good. And another question in from Pamela. Is the provincial or federal government providing funding to cover all of these additional costs being incurred for testing and cleaning and the sick day coverages and sending people home if they show fevers, et cetera? Well, they certainly are not helping us, but if anyone knows how to get them to, please give me a call. Uh, New Gold took on, took on the costs and we put in the investment um, for these devices uh, and for all of the additional costs that come with uh, hiring additional lab techs, nurses, the cleaning supplies, all of that. Um, we weren't going to wait for any sort of grants or any sort of partnership. Once they were approved, it was we were jumping on it and we were going to implement them and roll them out. Um, I do know from a community aspect, there are different ways that Indigenous communities can access funding to help with, uh, with testing uh, and covering the cost of testing supplies. Um, again, that's been part of the conversation that we've had with some of our partners uh, on a community basis, but for the company itself, it has, uh, it has just been covered by, by the company. Yeah, the, it, we made a point of not asking for government assistance on this. We were deemed an essential service and safety is our number one priority. So Renault Adams was one of the early ones on this said, look, we'll pay for this. Um, and uh, if First Nations uh, can access government funds, that's great, we encourage them to do so. But uh, the mining companies, we're, we just want more options to make it even better. Great, thank you. Any, uh, any other final, final questions or comments? Okay. If not, I will continue on. Sure. So thank you very much, but I am now going to uh, invite Trang uh, to, I guess, take over and mute. I'll keep her slide up, but again, you know, thank you not only to Chris, Beth and Gabrielle, and Trang's gonna thank you as well, but uh, it was great and very engaging. And uh, I would also like to thank Trang again for Forte's sponsorship for tonight's event. Trang? Hi everyone, can you hear me now? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Um, first, just wanna thank Chris, Beth and Gabby for the presentation tonight, specifically the new gold team uh, for sharing your results and your lessons learned from uh, your early use of the precision biomonitoring. Uh, really interesting presentation. 
And uh, also kudos really to your team for your leadership, demonstrating your leadership in this area and taking that first step. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Train Tran Balad. I have been with the CIM Sudbury branch for a long time, uh, but also in my day job, I'm the president of a company called Forte, who tonight is our, our sponsor. So on behalf of Forte, I just wanted to say um, that we're really pleased to sponsor the talk. Um, for those who don't know, we're a relatively new technology and manufacturing company here in Sudbury. We're part of the Innovinta group of companies that includes names that you may know, such as Best Tech, uh, Shift Inc, and Frosker. We primarily help mining companies optimize their supply chain process through introduction of mobile inventory management, as well as autonomous delivery of inbound materials. However, over the last few months with uh, COVID and the challenges that it's introduced, we evolved some of our technologies to deliver a safe, rapid, portable means of uh, sanitizing personal protective equipment, as well as uh, non-medical tools. So with that, I, I just wanted to quickly thank all the presenters and uh, invite you to visit our website, fortetech.com, and our follow us on social media if you're interested in learning more about the products. But otherwise, thanks again, and hope you enjoyed the talk tonight. Christine, back to you. Thank you very much, Trang. So really that, uh, that concludes our evening. Um, typically we would invite you back up to the, uh, to the foyer at Dynamic Earth and share a beer and continue, you know, to continue to chat and network. Unfortunately, uh, the times we're in, we have to do this remotely. So again, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, hope to see you out at our October student night. Have a good thank night, you. Everyone. Thank you very much, Christine. Okay.